Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this Zoom meeting as part of the celebrations for MacFest 2022. Uh, my name's Laura Wigan and I'm the ESOL manager and the reading teacher for the Level 1 ESOL study for programme group that you can see. We can see their faces uh, on this meeting. I would like to welcome Simon Mia, the award-winning journalist and writer who wrote the essay that the ESOL learners have been studying this term. I'd also like to welcome Kezra Shiraz, uh, the, the founder, curator, and ex executive director of MacFest, and Nicole uh, Harding from Hotwood Hall College, and Hanan from uh, MacFest as well. In our classes this term, we've been reading and discussing the essay, A Woman of Substance, uh, taken from It's Not About the Burqa, which is a collection of essays by female Muslim writers who present passionate essays about oppression, stereotyping, misogyny, and Islamophobia. The learners have really enjoyed the essay we chose that Simon wrote, and it's given us lots to discuss and uh, think about over the past few weeks. During this meeting, we'll be sharing our thoughts and asking questions about the essay. It would also be great if Simon could read an extract from her new novel, uh, which I've read and really enjoyed, and I'm sure the learners would enjoy too. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys this event. So let's begin by welcoming Simon Mir. Over to you. Um, thank you for having me. It's really uh, exciting and interesting to be here. I'm um, excited to hear what questions you've got. Okay, okay. Shall we? Shall we start? Or do you, would you like to say something about about yourself? Uh, I think. I we can start with questions because it sounds like everybody's read my essay, which I feel like I flash my life when I, talk, you? You know, when I wrote my essay. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist. I've been a, a journalist for uh, about 20 years, almost 20 years, probably more than that now. Um, and I'm of British Pakistani heritage. And interesting to me, my mum used to teach ESOL. So uh -huh. ESOL has a really special place in my heart. Um, I'm the daughter of immigrants. My parents are of Pakistani heritage. Um, so I kind of understand some of the struggles that people have and the challenges that they face when you come here to learn English. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think before we ask our questions, because uh, we, we've spent lots of time thinking and discussing about themes and, and linking it to culture and picking out passages from, from the essay. So um, can we share some of our thoughts with you before we ask you your before we ask you questions? Is that okay? I would love that. I'd love Great. To. Okay. Lord. Hi. My name is Lord. Uh, we saw some connection with these passages, and my classmate would like to share this part. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Arfa, and uh, I, I really like the in the part two where you divorce your second husband. I really like this part because uh, where you are uh, telling the truth that uh, other people deny. It was uh, really touching, uh, and I also really like because nowadays uh, most of the people really uh, want to eliminate this thought, but I think you did good at writing this in your book. Thank you. Uh, on, on page 60 and in part two, I like this line. It's, Islam gave women a wise cultural introduction, take, took it away, and I have the same point of view as yours. But our men have yet to pass up. I think it refers to men who think they have to live in the 60s, 70s, and they think they can use those methods to control or define women in this present days. All in all, I think it's a great punchline for we as the audience. Hello, my name is Athena. I like part two. I think she was lucky. I, I, I think you are, you are lucky because your family, because your family always um always with you uh, his your family always felt felt that it was it was best uh, it was best to to um, uh, to forget what happened in the past they thought that uh, it was uh, it was best uh, it was best to repair uh, to repair life uh, slam this as authorization if someone if some if someone gets married if someone gets divorced he he or she can uh, can get uh, can get remarried uh Hello, uh, my name is Fatima. Uh, my favorite part of your story was the 
part one because uh, it showed immediately uh, what was the story about about your uh, two marriages that you uh, that was divorced and how you felt and uh, we immediately knew on what would the book be about and what we were talking about and uh, i really like those kinds of books right? and uh, about how you moved forward about uh, how you moved forward of what you experienced hello my name is Sylvia, and i liked part two where you are able to overcome your fears and speak up for yourself instead of staying in a marriage where there's only suffering and pains. And I'm really happy for you. Hello, my name is Cheyenne. In part two, I could feel how you were strong. You had a lot of barriers in your way, but and you, you were tired, but you didn't give up. Hello, my name is Barakat. I like get the passage where you talk about the differences between shame and guilt. I somehow feel represented in that passage. Um, Lord, Lord, I think what we'll do next is go into the questions because uh, we do have lots of questions that we want to um, obviously ask and we want to hear your opinion. And then hopefully if we've got some time left at the end, we'll share some links between culture. Um, so should we ask questions? Who's first up? Uh, uh, hi, uh, I wanted to ask uh, who encouraged you you to write your story was it your own choice to write it or someone helped you? Uh, so the, you're asking who encouraged me to write the story um so i've been a journalist for a long time and i've written once about this before but i wrote about it under a pseudonym so i didn't put my name on it because i used to work for a local paper and i wasn't actually allowed to write for anybody else and i wrote for the guardian um, and I hadn't really thought about writing this again because it's such a personal story and um, it was hard to write that essay because it hurt because I had to almost relive a lot of my experience. Uh, but what happened is that somebody, Mariam Khan, who's the editor of It's Not About the Burqa, um, was putting together a collection of essays and she put a call out on Twitter saying, she wanted a Muslim woman to talk about divorce. And my sister um, saw it and she messaged me and said, they're looking for somebody. And so Mariam Khan, the editor and I, we had this conversation about divorce and what I thought about it and my experiences. And then she asked me, will you write this essay? And um, I, said, I said, yes. So I, because I've been a writer for a long time, but I wasn't, in, I hadn't been any books until then and I'd wanted to and I thought this is a brilliant opportunity for me to write a story that's personal and be published in a novel in a book and um, learn about publishing because I didn't know anything about publishing I didn't know anything about the industry no one in my family was published in this country um, so I then I, I said I, she said will you write it and I said yes and she had a deal with the publishing house Picador and so I wrote a, a draft of it for them and then the editor came back and asked questions and then I edited it and then I wrote a draft so I, I in answer to your other question who helped me um the, I worked with an editor a really good editor called Sophie Jonathan um and that's how the essay came about thank you uh, was it difficult for you to write it? Oh, it was it difficult for me to write it? Um, yeah. It was really difficult for me to write this piece. I the first draft I wrote, and it it was I mean it was painful. I think every draft I wrote because anything you ever write is the first draft of it is never good. It's it's just getting your ideas onto the page, and one of the things that I've really learned, I really want anybody who wants to write to know is that. The trick is to write whatever you think is rubbish is in your head on the paper. Just put it down. 
Um, so that, that's painful in itself, the fact that it's not very good and it doesn't feel as good as I want it to be. But then the content was really hard because I was reliving all these things that had happened to me. And as I say in that essay, I had a lot of shame attached to it. I was ashamed of myself and of my past. Um, and that's not right. And it shouldn't have been that way. But because I hadn't worked through the trauma of it, um, it was almost like uh, writing the essay was a bit like exorcising ghosts. So it was like the thing that was in me came out, the pain in me came out onto the page and then I sort of stopped feeling it. So it, it was really hard, but it was almost like pulling it, pulling that trauma like a snake out of me and then putting it onto the page. So yeah, it was really hard. Wow, that's really interesting. Do you receive, do you receive any hate by writing your essay? I don't, I didn't receive any hate for writing this essay, but I might have done, but I have a policy of never reading the comments under articles that I write. So when it came out in the Guardian, and when it came out in the Guardian, it went viral. So in two days, there was a quarter of a million hits. And I I'd had a baby. So what happened is, yes, I'd written this essay, I had a baby, and then two weeks later, the book came out. And so I was really busy. I don't know if any of you have children, but I have three. So this, my youngest, he was a baby. And I had this policy of never reading the comments under an article because um, nobody ever really sees it the way that you see it, the way they see it, the way they see the world, the way they are. So when someone sees your essay for what it is, it's because they're looking at the world in the same way as you are. Uh, so I can't, I can't process people saying, oh, she's crazy, what does she do? I don't have the time limit or the ban mental bandwidth for it. So it, they may have done, but it never, it didn't come to me. Um, how will you describe this book? How would I describe it? It's not about the burqa. Um, I think it's not about the burqa for me is a really honest collection of essays by Muslim women who self-identify Muslim women. Um, and I think that's really important because one of the things about being a Muslim woman is so many people decide that they know what Islam is and they know what a Muslim woman should be. And, you know, none of us really fit all the molds that all that, you know, whether you, what we wear is always discussed and how we, what we eat and drink is a, you know, bone of contention. And so for me, this is an essay of, um, the voices of self-identifying Muslim women. And it's an extremely important collection because uh, we see the diversity of voices within the faith. Thank you. Uh, good news. Uh, what was the other thing, other thing for you that you didn't want to announce? Sorry, I, I missed that question. What was the other, other thing for you that you didn't want to write about? In the essay or just in life in general? Yeah, in the, in the essay. In the essay, what was the hardest thing? Um, you know, I, I, when I first start, wrote this essay, I realized, because like I said, it was a bit like therapy for me. Um, it was the failure of it. I used to think before I'd written the essay and before my life became what it is now, that those mistakes were, they were my fault. They were failings, even though I hadn't, even though they were abusive relationships and they weren't, you know, I hadn't contributed to that. It felt like somehow I had made bad choices. It was me, I was the one. And I didn't want to admit that. I didn't want to admit that that could have been me. Then, like I said, the shame of it. I had a lot of shame associated with the fact that I had had these two arranged marriages. And for me, as a Muslim woman, I hadn't realized that I'd internalized a lot of the questions of wider white society, which is, but why would you have an arranged marriage? And why would you do it again? And um, so I was embarrassed and I was ashamed 
of the fact that I've done that. And it um, it was hard, though that was the hardest thing to write about. It's one of the interesting things in the classes to discuss the, the shame around the, the culture. Um, next, Lena. What have you learned uh, from this extremely difficult experience in your life? What have I learned from this? Um, do you know that that period in, the, in my life has been the making of me? And it's a discussion I have with my husband a lot. Now, my husband has this really happy, clappy life, and I have obviously had a lot of interesting experiences, but they've really made me. And um, I it's made me a much better person. I think it's made me a better parent because I am now, I've learned to fight for what I want in life. So there's a famous Bruce Lee quote, which is, it's better to be um, a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And I feel like I was a, a gardener in a war, basically. I didn't understand what life was. And I didn't know that if you want something in life, you have to go and get it. Um, and then you set your sights on it. And then you go get it and you make it happen. And I didn't know that. And that, that sounds like I was really naive and I was. Um, so I learned that. I learned how to fight. I learned how to um, control my ego. I think that's a, the biggest thing I've learned is to just suppress my ego, like get rid of it. You set your sights on what you want and without hurting anybody, without being unkind to anybody, um, because that's the other thing I learned was uh, I didn't want to become like the people who I had lived with. I, I'd made a decision that um, they had hurt me, but I couldn't be like that. But I still wanted to succeed and I still wanted to get the things I wanted. Um, yeah, so those two things, I think, how to be kind and how to still keep on going. I think it's incremental. When I look back now, and I think about how scared I was that time was passing and I was losing time and, you know, they had these two marriages and this was, it felt like a huge chunk of time. And when I was 21, the three months felt like a huge chunk of time. But looking back as a 47 year old woman now, I think that was a blip. It was a blip in my life and it felt immense. So the incremental nature of time and, and doing the work incrementally is another thing I've learned, which is just do the bit, put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. Um, because eventually then you get there. Um, yeah, and, I, and it sounds really obvious now when I'm talking about it, but I, I didn't know any of that stuff. I was just, I, I just was like, what's going on? Everything's imploding. But you just regroup and you figure it out and you carry on somehow. Thank you. Um, Christina. Hello, my name is Christina and I would like to ask you, how did you decide to do the title of your, your, of your essay? How did I decide the title of the essay? So A Woman of Substance is a book by Barbara Taylor Bradford. It was a very famous book when I was a uh, child. Um, and I just love this, the thing. And, and I think um, I am a woman of substance. I, I now own that. You know, there's, there's a lot of substance here. I'm not a flaky, superficial type. There is a lot of stuff. My husband says I'm dark and twisty, which I love. Um, so yeah, I think for women, for women my, from my background, being of substance, uh, was not a good thing. We're supposed to sort of be a bit lighthearted and do all that stuff, but not really talk about it. So I wanted to own that. You know, I am a woman of substance. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia. Hello. My question is, is there a message behind your essay or book in general? Is there anything behind it? Like a message. Uh, do you know, I, I don't actually now try and uh, set out to put myself out there when I write my stories, because what I found and what I've learned is that uh, it's just important for people to connect. And we 
I've been lonely in my life. There have been times when I've been lonely and I felt like no one understands what I'm going through or there isn't anybody. So I don't actually write things now to send a message. I write things to say, this is what's going on with me. Um, maybe you can relate to it too. And if you can, maybe we can kind of, you know, hold hands across the great internet. So I don't ever set out to give a message because I don't think I'm, it's not my place to give a message. And, and I, actually, I don't know if the message is right. Um, so I'm just there to show people this is how I feel and to hear people's experiences. Um, I think that's, that's the human experience that we um, should be able to tap into and should tap into. Thank you. Uh, so. Hello again. Uh, if you want to give an advice to a young girl, with exactly your situation, what would you say to, what would you tell her? I would tell her it's going to be okay. Life is a long game, and um, you. you have to be true to yourself and don't be afraid. If you're true to yourself, don't be afraid. Just put one foot in front of the other and keep going, and it will fall into place. That's really good advice. I should put that on a poster. <laughs> Um, Sarika. Again, um, I would like to know how was he raised? Did you hear all that, Sarika? I'm not sure. No, I, I, didn't, all that. I didn't get any of it. Okay. Do you want to repeat, Sarika? Let's see if it works. Um, hi. Um, the question is about your father. It seems like such a positive figure in your life. I would like to know how was he raised? How was my father raised? Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Can I just yeah. say all your questions are so interesting. I have done lots and lots of interviews, but this is the most, the most interesting uh, questions. And I'm really having to think on my feet to answer them. We like that. No one's asked me that. And I think it's a really important question because my dad, I now realize, um, was a true feminist, although he wouldn't know what feminist is. Um, if you said it to him, he'd be like, What's, well, this is just good sense, right? We should all be. Um, so my, my grandmother, my dad's mom, um, I think she had postnatal psychosis when my dad was about 10 years old. So she, this was in, they were in Africa in Kenya and he had a, she had a full on, um, at that time, no one knew what that was and so, she had a stillbirth, she had postnatal psychosis and she never recovered. And so my dad was 10 at the time and he, his mom went from being mentally well to suddenly not being there, not being present. Um, and she, they, it was quite a difficult traumatic time. My grandfather worked in Africa. They didn't have any family there. They were immigrants to that country. So after a while, my dad, was I think he was sent back to Pakistan and then he came here when he was 19 so really he was raised by his dad who was a very nice man and very respectful of his wife but he was a very old-fashioned man so my dad never spoke in front of him apparently you know whatever my grandfather said went um but my dad I think the loss of his mother had a huge impact on him and he talks about her to me now in a way he didn't used to before. Um, and he was raised, so there was two things. One, he lost his mother, so he had great respect for women. And the other was that his dad, even though my grandmother would, had had this break um, and she wasn't mentally there, uh, my grandfather was always very respectful of her. And my mum talks about that. She said that when she got married, she remembers my grandfather would always speak very respectfully to his wife. And he would address her as Begum Sahiba, which means, um, which is a really respectful term of, you know, my wife. And so, that, yeah, he had a trauma. My father had quite a traumatic childhood. And I think the reason he was the father he was is because he broke those uh, bonds of intergenerational trauma to raise us differently. And he wanted us to have the things he didn't have. And he wanted us to have a relationship with him that he didn't have with his parents. Um, and I think he met, felt the lo uh, loss of his mother really acutely. 
Yeah, no, I'm really, really oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, thank you so much, Laura. This is so such an interesting event. Oh. We've uh, we've got that we've got just a couple more questions from um, somebody who's at the couple well one learner couldn't come. Um, she wanted to know how are you now after what you wrote and what happened to you. Oh my goodness! I, I you can hear in the background. I've got three boys, so after what happened to me, I got again I got married to in the book essay I write about that. I've got three small boys: an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old. Um, my book came out in my novel came out here it is in um april it's doing incredibly well um i'm a very successful writer and journalist now i've been asked to speak at yale would you believe which is crazy i'm this young i'm not young but you know i was this little girl from bradford who's the daughter of these immigrants like i said um and my life is incredible. I mean, it's messy and it's normal and I have all the ups and downs that everybody has. Um, you know, the normal stuff. I'm not living in some beach house somewhere, but everything I wanted, everything that 21 year old girl wanted, she now has and, and more. That's, that's great. That's really nice to hear. Yeah, so I know when we were reading the story, we we all got quite emotional reading it, and we were like, oh, "What's going to happen next?" <laughs> so it's really nice to hear that it is is a happy ending. You know it, what? I've, the thing I've learned in life is that somewhere you get something happens. You know, somewhere you um, there's a bump in the road, and it tests you, and it, it either makes makes you or it breaks you, um, and it's just about being ready for it and, and understanding that this is life. This is, there is no, no one actually gets that Hollywood lifestyle and, and it's okay because you don't learn from that. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, do, we, do we have any more questions or shall we move on to our links to culture? Can, can, Chris, can Christina just say something? Hi again. I would like to say that I really admire you and you are a really brave woman. Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you. Uh, hi. I'm just really like shocked because it's amazing seeing someone that have overcome so much in her entire life. I just Wow, amazing. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, girls, for saying that. Uh, what we'll do now, if it's okay, is we just, we thought one of the things we did was we linked it to, to culture because in this class, we're not all Muslims. Um, so it was just linking your story uh, to, to cultures. Um, so I think first up is good news. Uh, hello again. Uh, Hi. I think this story affects in terms of partial links to the to the real world. I think your story affects many people in, this, in the world in so many ways. You could even say it affects our, our own parents more because of because of the generation that lives in no women rights. Divorce was, was not as common as it is now. No freedom of speech. They were either beaten with words or, or they were taken from them. At the end of the day, I think we should be thankful for the fight our mothers fought for us. I think they have laid the bedrock for us so that we could have freedom of freedom of speech. Women rights, and even when not feel comfortable or safe in a, in a, in a relationship, you could ask for a divorce. Thanks, good news. Saina, did you want to? Uh, hi, this story is experienced by you at very young age and divorce was very common at that time uh, in Pakistan and in other countries. And the story fits in the modern world where every single person is talking about the 
rise of human. Nowadays, when all this talking about climate change, there are also many countries who don't give the rise to women in the start. Uh, hi again. Uh, I wanted to tell you that the fact that you have experienced uh, all of this uh, pain uh, in your failed marriages that you had in your past uh, uh, made me uh, made me wonder that you had a lot of courage uh, to love uh, someone else uh, again because it isn't easy to love someone when you get when you you fail of it fail at it, fail at it uh, two times uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy. It's really interesting you say that because when I met my husband, who I'm married to now, my current husband, as I refer to him, um, jokingly, um, I I knew the thing is I was aware of everything you've just said. You're absolutely spot on. I was aware of it, and I met him, and he did this thing which I don't think I I don't know if I wrote about it in the essay, but he. Um, he filled our ha this house that we live in now with candles. He came to pick me up. I was at King's Cross Station. He picked me up, which is a half an hour, 40 minute drive from where I live. And he, he drove all the way home and he filled the house with candles. And I was on, I, I, it's not that I was unconvinced. Maybe I was unconvinced. I, I was what you're saying. I was scared. And, um, and I opened the door and there were these candles and I remember in that moment thinking, no one is ever going to do this for you again. This man, you have to marry him. You have to get out of your own way because you're going to ruin it for yourself because you're scared. And, and that's what it was. I was scared. And the, the thing that got me through it was I knew what I wanted my life to look like. And I knew that he was a good man and I liked him and all these things. But I was just really scared. Um, but then I had to I had to face my own. He was I was afraid of him, not because he was mean or nasty or anything, because he's like the nicest man you'll ever meet. But because I'd been hurt, um, I was absolutely petrified of um, that. It's not that I was afraid of divorce. I was just you you survive, right? And you armor up and you build these walls. But when you build the walls to keep yourself safe, you also keep love out. And you're you're right. I knew that. I absolutely knew that. And so I, I, my life, the way it looks now is what I wanted it to look like. Maybe with a better house that's not with broken walls because my children have damaged it. Um, so I just kept my eye on that goal. And, and thank God it worked, worked out. Thank you. Thank you for commenting there. Um, Sylvia. Hello. So I personally think that this story is related to other women that have experienced it. And this story shows that you are very brave to cut off the marriage, even when the father-in-law of the second marriage didn't think that you would do that. And in this world, there are many people that treat their daughter-in-law very badly. And it's very sad to see that. And but we have to give courage to other women to speak about it and just share it. Thank you, Sylvia. They need to be brave and stand up for themselves. Yeah, like like Simon showing us. Um Shane? Yeah. Hi again. Fall in love in young age and doesn't search about the person who is want to live with him until death. Sometimes the world affects you on woman. Maybe they will get the depression or something like something like that. So I would I would say don't you need to talk about it. No matter what happened. What will affect? Talk about it. Don't be quiet. Thank you. Well done, Shane. Thank you. Uh, that's those are our links to to culture and society and the world that we're living in today, Simon. I hope I hope you you feel the same.
It, yeah, it's so it's so interesting, and I completely agree with the fact that we need to talk more about um, what happens to us because our mental well-being. If we lose that, then um, it's really hard to get your way back and talking about it. And we do come. I think we have a lot of similarities, as you've said, in, in cultures. Um, and I completely agree that our mothers, even even though you know, I had a fight. There was incremental work that my mum had done. She was supporting me. Um, she was an educated woman. And I think, um, so when we talk about our mother, the work our mothers have done, yeah, um, I think it's important to honour that, definitely. I think it's important as well for, for the women to, to speak out, but also for the men to speak Absolutely. out. We should, we should all talk. It's good to talk. Definitely. And I think men, one of the other things that I'm really passionate about is one, men having the safe space to talk about their feelings and not feel judged. Um, my, you know, my, my dad, someone asked how my, what my dad's childhood was like. Well, my childhood of, when I look at my dad, if you think it was the 70s and the 80s, and my dad was a really, what we would now call a hands-on dad, which is a horrible phrase but he spent a lot of time with his children and he spent a lot of time taking us places and talking to us and being with us and being present in a time when not just Pakistani men, but white British men didn't do that. Um, and I think that was such a formative experience for me. I mean, it set the bar really high. You know, I was never going to settle for somebody just, you know, bringing home the money. They had to be present, but, um, that my father's behavior as a father who was present really impacted. I'm you know, 100% convinced that the life I have now is because my father was a hands-on dad. I hate that phrase. I don't know what the equivalent is because you know, we have, we, no one says moms are hands-on moms. Um, and he spoke up when it, when it needed to be spoken up. And I think men need to speak up for themselves and also we need allyship with men because we need men to stand by us because diversity we talk about inclusion and diversity well gender is the first bit of that and i know it's a complicated topic at the minute but um definitely we need to speak up for each other yeah, thank you um <clears throat> Excuse me, I was wondering, I think that, that's it for sharing of the culture. I was wondering, would you be able to read us a little bit from your new book? We're very excited to, to oh, well. hear. So my new book is called The Khan. There it is, as I told you. Um, and it's the story of Jia Khan. So I used to be, um, I started out in local papers and I covered a lot of crime stories. And I worked in Bradford, which had a big, um, British Pakistani community and I worked across Yorkshire and there were some great stories that I used to hear about that area and there were stories so you didn't always get to stand them up they didn't always have um, a kind of a, a case that went with them a, cri a, a legal case that went with them and but they stayed with me and I met some really incredible women and I met some strong women so it came up with the story of Jia Khan who is the reluctant daughter of a criminal kingpin. And she's a London lawyer, a very successful barrister. Um, and when her brother is kidnapped and her father is killed, she finds, finds herself drawn back into the underworld, navigating this world of, of men. Um, and she's British Pashtun. So I'm gonna to read to you from, um, which is page 143, where Khan goes to meet the Jirka, the Jirka are the group of men with whom her father ran the city of Bradford. So there are men, she is a barrister, they don't really respect her because she's a woman and she left um, and she married someone who they didn't really approve of um, and now her father's dead. So I'm going to read to you when she goes to meet them, if I can find the place. Uh, so here we go. Gia wondered what her father would have to say about the situation in which she now found herself. She had considered his dispensation of justice to be ugly and misguided, feeding only his ego and having no place in the betterment of society. 
She had argued endlessly with him over this man's value and that man's virtue, but nothing had ever been resolved. And today, these dangerous men, these men whose reign she had long wished to see end, stood before her, awaiting her guidance and instruction. She reminded herself of Binyamin and steeled herself for the onslaught. Janan Khan spoke first. He was the eldest of the men. His tone was cold, his manner frosty, yet he began with kind words to her. I would like to offer my condolences to you. Your father was a true Bhatan and a king among our people. We will miss him and pray you find peace. A wry smile spread across his face and he bared his teeth. You are many things, Jia Khan, but you are not our Khan. You are a woman, he said. I am here to listen to my father's people, she responded. Silence fell across the room, followed by a sound from deep within Janan Khan's belly. He was laughing at her. He turned to his comrades, smirking, and they joined him. Their half-suppressed scorn awoke an old hatred in Jia, one that she had not felt in some time. Anchoring herself with a reminder of who Janan Khan was, she refused to take the bait. His ways were the old ways, his sensibilities the old sensibilities. His green eyes had grayed watching time and people change, but his archaic interpretation of honor and loyalty had not. And he believed that women should know their place. Jia knew hers and it was not at the feet of these men. She raised her hand to silence them the way she had seen her father do many times. She was on course to become a judge under British law, so she knew how to control a room. Maybe that is why they stopped laughing. On the other hand, this was not that world, and this was a world in which her worth remained unproven. She waited, allowing the silence in the room to grow until it became unbearable, and Janan Khan exploded. She will lead us into destruction. Look at her, so frightened that she dare not even speak. His anger infected his comrades, and their voices rose like a rabble. Bazid Khan tried to silence them again, but Janan would have none of it. The two men's voices became louder and louder with others at the table trying to outshout each other. Harsh words were exchanged in English and Pashto accusations flung and age old wounds torn open. Jia listened, their words watering the anger within her and she blamed her father. Was this his badal for her to let her walk in his shoes? The rage that had taken root when she'd heard what had happened to Binyamin wrapped around her sinews like ivy. She straightened up, her head being pulled by an invisible string that hung from the rafters. She looked at the old men who had built the family empire alongside her father, the men who owned the city and intimidated its inhabitants. She watched them spit and seethe and goad each other, unable to control their tongues and their tempers, and a calm came over her. She was better than this. She was smarter than them and she had nothing to prove. Thank you so much. That was really, that was great to listen to. I think we've, we've ordered copies for the library, so we'll be able to read it in class and then be able to borrow it and read it at home. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, I think that that's the end uh, of our event. Um, I'd, I just wanted to say thank you to you, Simon, for taking time out of your busy schedule, because I know how busy you are, to, to, to come and, and, and talk to the learners and give such honest, honest answers. Um, you really have been an inspiration to all of us, so yeah, we've, we've really enjoyed reading your work. Um, I also want to say well done to all my class who I'm so proud of them, so proud of them. They've been so mature through the whole thing because the, the themes that we, we discussed, it's, it, it has been tough for them. Um, and I, I think we've handled it really well. Um, and the, the extra work that they've done, they've done lots and lots of homework over the past few weeks in preparation for this event. They've come on time, they've come prepared, they, they've done really, really well. So well done, well done to all of you. Um, and also to Kesra, thank you to Kesra and, and Hanana for, for coming. Uh, would you like to close the event, Kesra?
Yes, thank you so much, Laura. What can I say? I'm just so, so glad I joined uh, this event. Uh, first of all, to Saima, our guest speaker, I loved listening to you, Saima. I have to read your book. Well done, you. I'm really, really proud. And mashallah, you've done it. You are definitely a woman of substance. No oh. doubt about it. Good on you. <laughs> and you've exceeded, mashallah, done well in the field of journalism and in writing. And of course, you celebrate diversity. And as a woman, you're a beacon. And I'm really proud of you. And I'm so glad we've got you in this context because the questions from the young people here from college were amazing, very sensitive, thoughtful. And that meant we got a lot of to hear about things that we wouldn't have in another context. So you praise them about that. And I totally agree with you. And I'm really thankful to Laura, Nicole, and of course the Hopwood Hall management team for hosting this another amazing event from MacFest, which is Muslim Art and Culture Festival. And the mission is to celebrate diversity, bring uh, awareness about the Muslim community and above all challenge Islamophobia through celebrating the Muslim artists, speakers, writers, as in this, in this case, your case, Saima. And of course, as Laura said, we celebrate the diversity of all cultures. So, okay, we're celebrating MacFest, but really what colleges do normally, our schools do, is celebrate all cultures equally because we celebrate equality. So every single person who's here in this room today, you are part of the festival as well. And we value your background, your identity, your culture. So a big thank you, especially to Laura, to Nicole for putting this event together. And inshallah, we will put this tomorrow uh, or the next day on our YouTube channel as part of MacFest, so you can catch up on it later. And I think we've got everybody's permission to actually post things on social media. So look out, follow us on Twitter for MacFest and others. So thank you so much and good afternoon and assalamu alaikum <laughs> from us from MacFest in Manchester. And back to you now, Laura and Nicole. Nicole, would you like to say something as you are our main contact for MacFest? I, I don't think I can really add anything. Just wanted to say a huge thank you to Laura for sorting this out. Um, obviously, massive thanks to Saima for, for coming along and sharing your thoughts. I appreciate it. it's been quite an emotional um, session for everybody. I think we've all had a little uh, little emotional response to, to the things that we've been talking about. Um, and thanks, Kezra, for putting on such a fantastic uh, festival programme, which means we can do things like this. So. Um, I, I'm taking zero credit for this, absolutely nothing. Laura has done so much work for this, um, months of work to make sure that this has happened um, and to really make sure that this, this event was a success, which I think it, it absolutely has, but it's been fantastic. Um, so that, that's all that I can add, really. Thank you.